born a poor white boy. That's, you know, they say that doesn't exist, but it does. I remember as a kid, we couldn't afford milk, so we'd eat grape nuts with apple juice. You ever eat cereal with apple juice? Yep. Well, you get used to it after a while, but it ain't that great. So I was born in July of 1974, and I was born again in July of 1992. So I have two birthdays in the same month, and I thank God for that. That's right. And thank God for my father that led me to the Lord. And uh, I'm going to give my testimony, and like Brother said, sometimes people are confused. You know, there's a lot of people out there who think they're saved, and they're not. That was my testimony. I thought for many years I was a Christian, and I wasn't. This is Bob Jones Sr. This is a message he preached in 1940. Six, And he said, I quote, And I tell you frankly, after having preached the gospel in most of the states of the Union, I do not believe 50% of church members are really Christians. Mm -hmm. I don't believe 50% of people that claim to be saved are really saved. So why would he say that? Well, because in churches there are a lot of lost people. The reason is a lot of folks aren't preaching the gospel. Right. And that's a shame. Right. Yep. And I was in church most of my life, if not all of my life. All right? And let me read Isaiah 64, 6 real quick. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Uh, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You know, we like to think of ourselves as good people, don't we? But God looks at us and all He sees is unclean, filthy, awful thing. And that's what we are until we're saved. So I was born and raised in Milton, Florida. Mom and Dad would go to church sometimes. And um, sometimes they'd go to a Pentecostal church. Sometimes they'd go to a Baptist church. Sometimes they'd go to Peter S. Ruckman's church. And my mom didn't like that. She liked the Pentecostal. Dad didn't like that. He liked the more extreme Ruckman. So a lot of times they'd compromise and do the middle thing, and they'd both go to a liberal Southern Baptist church. So I was very confused as a kid. I can honestly say I never heard the gospel one time in all that time in a church. Not even at Ruckman's. I don't know why. And I went to his Sunday school for kids and things like that. Why was I never taught the gospel? Why was I never preached how to be saved? Why was I not that important that nobody wanted to tell me how to get to heaven? And so when I was little, I remember I was about five years old sitting in the kitchen. And I'm sitting there eating my cereal, <laughs> grape nuts with <laughs> apple juice. And I started crying. And my mom says, what's wrong? And the thought came in my head that one day I'm going to die and I'm going to cease to exist. And that just bothered me just knowing that I wouldn't exist anymore. And my mom says, well, you need to ask Jesus in your heart. Now, I can honestly say I didn't know who Jesus was. I would heard his name in the churches we went to. I thought he sat in the back pew back there somewhere. That's what I thought. So I said, oh, Jesus, whoever you are, come into my heart. Was I saved? I was five years old. You know, there's nowhere in the Bible does it say ask Jesus in your heart. That's not there. I really don't like that term because that's not salvation. But as I got older, I began to ask how to be saved. And I remember when I was young, my dad would give me some chick tracks and say, read these chick tracks. So I'd read the chick tracks, and at the end of the chick track, it says, now pray this prayer after me. And so I'd pray that prayer. And I prayed that prayer every night from age 13 to age 18. How many prayers would that be? You know which one saved me? None of them. Because my thought in my mind was the prayer itself saved me. So I had to do that prayer. And people say, are you a Christian? I go, yeah. And they say, are you sure? I go, no. So I'd say the prayer over again just to be sure. Do you see how I was trusting in what I did right. and not what God did for me? I was still confused thinking that that's what saved me. So I did it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Well, my mom and dad got divorced when I was 14, and I had to go and live in Oklahoma for four years with my mom. And I went to the Assembly of God Church. Four years I was in the Assembly of God Church. And do you think they taught me the gospel? Not one time. They told me you have to ask Jesus in your heart and repeat the real prayer and speak in tongues and don't sin or you'll lose it and do this and do that. And I had a works gospel. I honestly thought that if I did what they told me to do, I'd get that. But every night I'd cry my eyes out before I went to sleep saying, please, God, don't let me wake up in hell. Because I didn't have the true gospel of salvation. I didn't know how to be saved. But one time at a summer camp, they, they said, hey, um, you want to you wanna receive the Holy Spirit? I said, yeah. So they all held hands and they prayed and they said, say these words. Lord, 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 Lord. So I said, Lord, 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 like they said. And they said, oh, you got it, you got it. Asla Shandai and Taya Bowtie and all that stuff. And they tried to convince me that that was the Holy Spirit. 
And I would go to the to the youth meetings at that church and see these kids on Sunday. Oh no, no, we love the Lord. And I knew on Saturday night they were out fornicating and living like the devil and getting drunk. And I'm thinking, how can they be saved on Friday and Saturday night? And now they're saved on Sunday. What did they lose it and get it back? And lose it and get it back. And I saw all these things and I said, there's something wrong with this. This isn't the, the way to heaven. This is this is religion. There's something wrong with you. But I couldn't understand. All I wanted was to come back home. So when I turned 18 years old, I sold everything I had. And two weeks later, I came back home. And my mom had warned me. She said, watch out for your dad, because he's one of those Ruckmanite people. And she said, watch out for him, because that Ruckman guy, well, he's too legalistic, and he's all about the Bible, and you've got to watch out. Your dad's in a cult. So I come back home, and two weeks later, my dad says, come here, son, I want to talk to you. And I thought, uh-oh, here it comes. Here's the cult man trying to get me in his cult. Now let me tell you my dad's testimony first. My dad went to PBI, but he didn't graduate. But my dad went to PBI, and he was going through the same thing that I was going through, and I didn't know it. My dad was lost. He'd been an Episcopalian. He'd been done something to, sprinkled to or something as a Catholic. He, he did all these things, and he did everything they told him to do, but he didn't know if he was saved or not. And he went to Ruckman's, and he was in Bible school. And every night he cried. He said, God, I don't want to go to hell. I think I'm saved, but I'm not sure. And every time he'd ask them, they said, well, just repeat this prayer after me. If it didn't work the first time, why didn't it work the second or third? So one day he's in Bible class, and Ruckman goes, where's that guy that has a health food store? And my dad had a health food store down on, uh, it's not Davis, is it? Is it Davis Highway? Or what was it? Pace. The first one was in Pace, and the other one was over there where that pizza place is, um, right there next to you, where Olive Garden is, the pizza place. He used to have that. That's the one I remember as a kid. But the other one was over by your saying on Pace. I never saw that one. And Ruckman goes, that's a saved man that owns that health food store. And my dad goes, oh, I must be saved because Ruckman said so. Oh, I'm saved because Ruckman said so. He literally thought, I'm going to heaven because Ruckman said so. But he wasn't saved. Right. It wasn't until my mom left that he was left alone that he spent time in the Word and prayer, and then he finally got saved. And it was from the Word that he got saved, from reading the Bible. So here we go to where I come home, and two weeks later, my dad sits me down on the kitchen counter, and he says, Now, son, i got to ask you something. He said, Son, are you saved? And I thought, Oh, boy, here we go. I said, Yeah, I'm saved. And my dad said, Why are you saved? I said, Because I've been in church my whole life. And he goes, Here, show me in the Bible where it says going to church gets you to heaven. And I went, uh, uh. And he went and he showed me some verses. And then he said, now, son, are you saved? And I said, well, yeah, of course I'm saved, Dad, because, um, uh, because I was baptized. So let me show you a Bible verse, son. He took me over to 1 Corinthians, you know. God sent me not to baptize with the preach the gospel. And that's what saves us is the preaching of the gospel, not, not the water baptism. So why are you trusting in that? And I said, well, he said, are you saved? I go, well, uh, 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 you know, I'm trying to search for an answer. Well, I'm a good person. He goes, let me show you some Bible verses, son. He flips over to Romans chapter 3. There's none good, no, not one. All of sin. Everything that I'm trying to tell him, he's taking away from me with the Scripture. It's making me mad. He said, son, are you saved? I said, well, I spoke in tongues. He goes, let me show you some Bible verses, son. And he goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And he showed me that whole chapter. He showed me, and I was like shocked because it says the women aren't supposed to do that. And the churches I was in, it was only women doing that. My dad said, that's not salvation, son. That's a written, spoken language. What language did you speak in? And I said, uh, none of them. <laughs> Matter of fact, he showed me Romans 8. I believe it's verse 26, where it says, The Holy Spirit maketh groanings to God that cannot be uttered. What are these Pentecostals doing? Saying, we're speaking to God, and the Holy Spirit's making utterance to God for us. And the Bible says, no, that can't be uttered. They're doing the exact opposite of what the Bible says, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And so my dad said, well, are you saved, son? And I go, oh, well... I said, I don't know. He said, would you like to know? I said, yeah. So he took me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the first time in my life I'd ever heard the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. You've got to stand in this. I was standing in all the things that I did. I was trusting in what I did, thinking I deserved heaven because I did this, this, and this. But all my righteousness was as filthy rags. I didn't see it as such. I thought I was a good person. 
By which also you are saved, verse 2. If you keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Believing in vain is believing from the head, not from the heart. Or you can say vanity. It's trusting in something you did instead of what the gospel is. Because the gospel is all that Jesus did for you. Not what you do to get to heaven. What He did so that you can go to heaven. Verse 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now look at this word. How. You ever seen that word before? How that Christ died for our sins. Do you know it's not just that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again? The gospel is how He died. Yep. In Hebrews 9.22, it says, Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Jesus Christ had to shed His blood. And all my life, I got a bloodless gospel from mm-hmm. all the churches we went to. My dad told me years later, he said, I heard that word the first time from Peter Ruckman. And he was talking about the bloodless gospel. Watch out for the bloodless gospel. And so my dad explained to me here, look how Christ died for our sins. He shed His blood for your sins according to the Scriptures. And it says twice according to the Scriptures because in the Old Testament they had to sacrifice an animal and shed its blood and there was no forgiveness without that blood. And then my dad said, now Jesus is over here on this side now He had shed His blood and it's the blood that forgives of sins. And it says how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And my dad was going through and he's giving me all these different verses in the Bible and I'm just soaking it in and looking at it and just going, wow, how come no one's ever showed me this before? How could I be 18 years old and no one ever showed this to me? And I was actually kind of mad because you're sitting in church. You should have heard this. Right. But I wasn't getting this. Then my dad turns over to Romans chapter 3 and he goes, let's go to Romans chapter 3 and let's read here. And he starts reading there in verse 22. Now, of course, he showed me that it's not of works. He said, are you saved? I said, I think so because I do good works. He goes, let me show you this verse. He went to Ephesians 2. 8 and 9, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So he said, son, it's through faith that we're saved. Romans 3.22, even the righteousness of God. See, my righteousness is filthy rags. I can't get to heaven on my righteousness. I need God's righteousness. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Salvation is by believing through faith. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. This guy too. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're redeemed through Christ. Through what? Through His blood. Amen. And then my dad goes to verse 25. And he says, Son, now I want you to read this. So he gave me the Bible and I start reading. And I read, Whom God set forth to be a propitiation. And my dad says, Stop right there. Let me explain it to you, son. You listen to Michael? So my dad says, What does that mean, Propitiation. I said, uh, I'll go get the dictionary. You know, there's a lot of big words in the Bible sometimes we don't use every day that we don't understand. Right. And my dad says, no, 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 don't go get the dictionary. Let me explain it to you like this. A propitiation is like a substitute. Yes. Now, I know it literally means the act of appeasing wrath. But my dad says it's like a substitute. He said, son, let's say you went to McDonald's and you killed five people in cold blood with a knife or a gun or something, and you're a horrible murderer. I said, oh, I'd never do that. He says, what if you did? He said, do you deserve to go to jail? I said, yeah, I deserve to go to jail if I did something that awful. He said, do you deserve to die? I said, yeah, yeah, I do. I deserve to die if I took the lives of five other people. I I would deserve that. My dad says, well, you know, here in Florida, they do the electric chair. My dad said, what if you got before the judge and he declared you guilty and they said, you know, in so many days you go to the electric chair and they sit you down in the electric chair and they're just about to flip the switch and you're all tied in there. And my dad says, what if I came in and said, let him go, I'll take his place. And I went, you do that for me, Dad? And my dad said, no. <laughs> he said, but son, that's what Jesus did for you. Right. And instead of the electric chair, it was the cross. Yep. And he looked at you and he saw you guilty, deserving hell. And right. he said, hey, I'll take your place. And he came up here and he died in my place for my sins. Yes. When I saw that, my eyes got big. That was the first time I really understood. I was like, what? How come no one ever explained that to me? I thought it's what I did that got me to heaven. No, he took my place. Yes, and then my dad said, and I'll read the rest of the verse. So Romans 3.25 says, Whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Right. See, salvation is by faith. Faith in what? What did he do? He shed his blood. Yes, he did. So that day, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. And I went, that's it? 
And my dad goes, that's what? That's what I've been looking for my whole life. Yeah. Salvation. My dad said, now son, I've asked you many times. Let me ask you now. When did you get saved? I said, right now. And he kind of was shocked. He goes, well, what, do you, what do you mean? I said, now I understand what he did and what the gospel is. And with all my heart, I trust the blood for Amen. salvation. Amen. And that's what I needed is to see that because salvation is not what we do. Right. It's trusting in what he did for us. Amen. I didn't even say a prayer. I just believed in my heart. Now, I'm not against prayer. I've seen people get saved while they pray. But it's not the prayer that saves you. Right, right. See, I was trusting in my prayer all those years mm -hmm. instead of trusting in the propitiation. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got it wrong is because I thought it was what I did. And I was begging God and pleading and asking God, Oh, God, please save me. Oh, God. And God's like, what more can I do? <laughs> Just come to me and trust. And someone had to open the veil of my eyes and help me to understand that I was being my own sacrifice. I was trying to do it my way and save myself based upon what I did. And that's not how we're saved, Michael. It's not what we do that gets us to heaven. Right. Right. We have to accept what Jesus did. Amen. And when you trust in what He did for you, you're saying, you know what? I'm no good. You're everything. Mm -hmm. And I just throw myself down at you because I can't get to heaven in my righteousness. That's right. It's filthy. You have to clean me. And so I trust your blood for forgiveness of my sins. And my dad said, read the rest of the verse. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness mm -hmm. for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. I looked at myself and I said, all these years I thought I was righteous and I deserve heaven. That's why I wore my suspenders, by the way, so I could do this. Because I deserve heaven because I'm such a good person. And I was a hell-bound sinner. Yeah. Because God looked at me and all he saw was filthy, nasty, disgusting. But when I saw what Jesus did for me, I was like, I'm unrighteous. He's the righteous one. Yes. Amen. And by faith, I declare him righteous. Yes. And I trust in what he did for me. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just. And the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. See, when you trust in what He did for you, you're giving up what you did. That's right. There's not one drop of my own self-righteousness that I'm holding on to. I can't because I see that it's not worth it. I'm trusting solely and completely in the blood and righteousness of my Amen. Savior, Amen. Jesus Christ. That's right. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. My dad asked me, are you saved? And I was boasting in myself. Well, yes, because I did this. You know what? I don't boast anymore. I can't boast on that. That's right. It's not about me. Amen. I'm the one that messed up. He's the one that saved me. It's yes. all about him right. and what he did. Amen. Whereas boasting then is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Now look at verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith mm -hmm. without the deeds of the law. Now look at that word, justified. The first four letters mm -hmm. of that word. That's right. What's it say? Just. Move it over two letters, what's it say? If. if. Then move it over the rest, what's it say? I. Do you know what salvation is? It's forgiveness of all your sins. It's just if I never sinned. That's right. Because God forgives me of all my sins. Amen. And it's not because I did something to get myself to heaven. It's because of what He did for me. That's right. And when you see that, when you understand that, and you come to Him, and you see that you're a sinner, and you realize you're lost... Then you realize, hey, the only way to be saved is to trust what He did. Yes, sir. You give up your own self-righteousness and you trust in the blood atonement of Christ. Amen. So I got saved. There's a lot more to it. Let me um, go ahead and just say this because I'm here. Amen. <laughs> so I got saved and I started to tell people. I actually drove back to Oklahoma and told all those people in the Pentecostal church they thought I was nice. I gave them the true gospel of salvation and they made fun of me and ridiculed me and put me down. So I came back and I started to preach on the street corner. I started to live for the Lord. I wanted to share with people this message of salvation through faith in the blood of Christ. My dad told me his testimony and how he didn't hear it. That didn't mean they weren't preaching it. For some reason, he just didn't hear it. But he says now after he got saved, he would remember they would preach faith in the blood. And he would take me to churches after I got saved. And I would hear the pastor say, put your faith in the blood of Jesus, faith in the blood. Then five years, then ten years, then fifteen years go by. And I didn't hear it as much as I used to. Right. And my dad used to say, son, how come, how come they're not preaching what they used to? Mm. Ruckman was the one that said, don't preach the bloodless gospel. <laughs> and my dad said, man, I love that saying from Ruckman, the bloodless gospel. Yes. 
And so my dad said, son, what you really need to do is you need to go to the Pensacola Bible Institute. Well, at that time, I was at the University of West Florida, and I was there for a whole year. I said, this is not for me. This is not what God wants in my life. I don't want to be around these people. I'm so, oh, so vexing in my spirit. So I took off a year, and then the next year I enrolled at Pensacola Bible Institute. And my dad said, son, go there, learn the Bible, sit in the back pew, keep your mouth shut, and then leave. And that was a warning that my dad gave me, and I just, I always wondered why. Another man gave me the same warning. He said, brother, sit in the back pew, keep your mouth shut. And if you're going to stay in this church and go out as a missionary, you just keep your mouth shut. And that's what I did. I did my best to do that. And while I was in school there, I began to see some things that, that bothered me a little bit. And I didn't even know this till years later, but uh, my dad, he sent a letter to Dr. Ruckman. And at that church, guess what happened? The Hilesism got into that church. Yeah. If you don't know who Jack Hiles is, Jack Hiles is a mess. Yes. He was a Baptist preacher who was trained by John R. Rice. And John R. Rice said before he died, I made a mess. I made a monster out of Hiles. Mm. And Hiles is the guy that started what they call the Romans Road. Now you know what? There's some great verses in the book of Romans. Mm. But not one of them were the ones I gave you today. <laughs> he just goes, one, two, three, repeat after me. That's the Hiles Road. One, two, three, repeat this prayer. And, and they've whittled the gospel. They don't even give the gospel. They've whittled it down to one, two, three, repeat after me. Well, where's repentance? Right. <laughs> repentance is a change of mind, change of heart. It's, it's turning from one thing to another, from trusting your righteousness to trusting Christ's righteousness. Yeah. With the Hiles method, you just get a person to repeat after you, and then you tell them they're saved. And I've seen a lot of people get deceived like I was. And they don't know if they're saved. And so they say, well, I'll do the prayer all over again. And they, do it, and they do it all over and over. So I have my prayer letter. Every two months I send out my prayer letter. I'm going to leave it up here for you. I want you to get this before you leave. And from preaching online all the time, I get so many people sending me their testimony. And they're like, man, thank you for sharing because, man, mine's just like yours. I never heard the truth. They told me just repeat the prayer and you're saved. But I never knew if I was saved. But when you preach on the blood... Just opened my eyes and I realized I've been trusting in what I did. My baptism, my church attendance. My, now I trust the blood. Amen. And I'm just glad to hear people getting the message. But what's sad is I noticed that I don't want to put down the church that I used to go to in the Bible school. But a lot of that Hylesism got in there. I'm not the kind of guy that backs down. If I see something, I say something, okay? My wife says I have no filter. Well, I'm sorry, I just can't. If I see it's wrong, I say something. But I try to do it in love, amen? But it just comes out of me. I can't stop it. If you're doing wrong, I'm going to say something. Okay? <laughs> That's the way it should be. Well, my dad, back in 1993, so I got saved in 92, and I didn't go to Bible school until 95. And I graduated in 98. And yes, I did graduate from the Pensacola Bible School. Okay? There are people out there alive that say I didn't. Huh? You can come to my house someday and see my diploma if you want to see it. I mean, I don't know why people lie. But my dad sent a letter to Ruckman and said, Ruckman, you're the guy that used to preach on... Don't preach the bloodless gospel. How come a lot of the graduates in your school go around and tell people, just ask Jesus in your heart or to repeat this prayer after me? Or just, why aren't they preaching the blood like you taught me? Right. And this is the response letter from Ruckman to my dad. And you can have that if you want to read it. Okay? You can have a copy of that. I brought them with me. Ruckman used to preach the blood atonement of Christ for salvation. And he says it here real well. Um, a lot of people nowadays, what they'll do is they'll preach Romans 10, 13 instead of the rest of Romans chapter 3 mm -hmm. and chapter 10. Let's go to Romans 10, 13. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, I'm up on the roof and I'm a lost carpenter and I just hit my finger with the hammer. Oh, Jesus! Did I just get saved? <laughs> but I called upon the name of the Lord, didn't I? But I did it in vain. So when it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, what is the context? Is the context just with your mouth? Well, the Bible says the heart. Yeah. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, well, if that's all you do, is, are you saved? No, because it continues. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto what? So it's a heart belief. There's something you have to believe in from the heart to be saved. That's the blood of Christ. Romans 10, verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. It's very easy to get someone to repeat a prayer, especially children. Mm -hmm. My wife's testimony is similar to mine. 
When we were five years old, we were instructed, just repeat this prayer after me and ask Jesus in your heart. And that's when we got damned. <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but that's when we were deceived into thinking we were saved when we were right. Because we just did something with the mouth, but we weren't trusting in what we're supposed to be trusting in from the heart. So when I talk like this, you know what they say about me? Well, one guy said, Robert Breaker preaches too hard on the blood of Jesus. That's why he's a heretic. Wow. Isn't that a confession that they don't? That's right. And I'm not trying to put them down, but I'm trying to tell you, the Bible says in the last days there will be apostasy. Yes. Apostasy is a falling away. That's right. And I've been to over 200 churches preaching. And every time I get up in a church to preach, I like to ask this. Who can tell me here where the gospel is in the Bible? Mm -hmm. About 12 times has someone raised their hand and said 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The rest of the time, they're just looking at me like a tree full of owls. Wow. I said, anybody except the pastor. Not me, but sometimes I'd ask the pastor. He's like, <laughs> you know. But I said, all right, then let's learn that. Because doesn't the Bible say preach the gospel? Well, how do you preach something you've never even heard? You know? Here it is. Faith can make you hear by the word of God. You don't even know what it is. How are you going to preach it if you don't know what it is? So I try to inform people, tell people, I see a lot of people not preaching hard enough on the blood right. and the gospel. So I want to do that. Well, so toward the end there, um, I go to Honduras as a missionary and come back, and Laura and I get married. And then Laura's with me on the mission field, and she wakes me up one night in the middle of the night and said, Honey, I just got saved. She'd been in an independent Baptist church a lot of her life, and she hadn't been taught the gospel. She was holding on to something she did as a kid, her own self-righteousness. And God showed her. There were some gospel tracts from someone else that she read. There were some Bible verses, a couple of preachings of mine, but not a lot of them. And she realized, you know, I'm not trusting the blood alone. I, I'm adding my own righteousness. And so she got saved on the mission field with me. Well, I thought people would like to hear about it in a prayer letter. So I had her write up her testimony, and we sent it to over 200 churches. Now let me tell you this quickly. I don't want to go too long, right? While I was in Bible school, there was a guy that showed up there in Bible school, and he sat in front of me in church, and he had long curly hair and a biker jacket. Not that it's wrong to, to ride a motorcycle. Where's Ray? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with riding a motorcycle. But this guy showed up, and he said he was a Satanist that just got saved, he said. And uh, so I said, well, let's, you know, tell me about it. And uh, he said, well, I just crawled up in a tree, and I said, I don't want to be a Satanist anymore. Oh, God, save me. Amen. I said, is that all? Tell me any more, any Bible that you know. I never read the Bible. I just did that, and now I claim to be a Christian. I said, well, it shows me that you want to be saved, that you want to be a Christian, but what about the gospel? What's that? What about? Uh, so I said, well, maybe you need to, uh, to read some more and study some more and see if you're saved or not, because if, if that's all, where's the faith from the heart? And so he started arguing with me at school. <coughs> and he said, well, with the mouth, confession is made of salvation. I said, yeah, but with the heart, man. But he didn't like that part. Mm -hmm. He liked the fact that he did something with his mouth, but he didn't, matter of fact, go to Matthew 15 with me. Actually, yeah, 15, 8. You know what the problem was with the Pharisees? Mm -hmm. They came to God with their mouth, but not with their heart. Right. You know what I mean? Matthew 15, 8, what does it say? Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 says, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from the throne. Mm -hmm. Salvation is through the faith in the heart, mm -hmm. not just saying something with the mouth. A lot of people are Christians in mouth only. Yep. They're not trusting from the heart. So this guy was there, and we talked for a little while. I said, why don't I buy you some dinner? I took him out to the awful waffle, the waffle house. I said, what's this all about? He says, well, these were his words. If what you're preaching is true, I'm still lost, and I don't want to think that way. I said, well, I don't want you to be lost. If all you did was with your mouth say something, but you haven't trusted with your heart, you are lost. Let me show you. And I took him through the Scriptures like my dad took me through the Scriptures. So why do you think you're saved? Why do you think? Showed him Romans 3.25. He's like, that's it. I see it now. He says, I was lost. I'm trusting only in the blood of Tony Christ for something. Lost man in church. I want to make sure that I tell people, put your faith in the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So question, are you saved? Amen. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. Mm -hmm. And let me close with this. My dad would do this, and I noticed my dad when he would witness to people. He would say, let me ask you a question. 
<coughs> if you were to die right now and stand eyeball to eyeball with Jesus Christ and he should ask you, why should I let you into heaven? How would you answer? And a lot of people would go, wow, oh, stand before God. And, and he asked me, why should I let you into heaven? And, they, and then you go, well, I, and my dad goes, wrong answer. <laughs> and they go, what, what do you mean? But, but, but I, eh, wrong answer. I mean, he wouldn't let them talk. If they said, but I, my dad says, wrong answer. <laughs> I always thought that was so funny. And then they go, but, but, and he goes, okay, tell me what you're going to say. Well, because I was baptized. <laughs> ah, wrong answer. Oh, because I go to church. No, wrong answer. Well, I repeated the prayer. Well, if you believe from the heart, then you're saved. But how do I know that? If you're trusting in the repeating, where was the repentance, if you will? You know, where's the, so my dad would say, uh, no, wrong answer, if they gave the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And they'd get mad at my dad. They'd say, well, well, what would you say? And my dad would say, just three words. Lord, the blood. <laughs> I don't deserve heaven. The only thing getting me here is the blood that washed my sins away. So it's not I, it's the blood. Amen. It's Jesus. Amen. So do you see salvation? It's not what we do or have done to get us saved or to keep us saved. Are you trusting in the blood atonement of Christ, what he did to save you? Do you still doubt it? When you're saved, you should know you're saved. Yep. Being saved is like two things in the Bible. Like being married and like being born. Yeah. I've never met somebody who goes, you know, Brother Breaker, don't tell anybody this, but I don't know if I've ever been born or not. I don't know if I'm really here. <laughs> I doubt if I exist. That just sounds weird, doesn't it? But salvation is being born again. And I've never met somebody that says, you know what, I don't, I don't remember. I don't even, I don't know if I'm married or not. All right, well, when you wake up in the morning, turn over to bed and see if somebody's there. You know, if you are, you're, I mean, these are two things that you don't doubt, you know. So salvation is supposed to be a no-so salvation. Yes, right. And for years I lived thinking I was saved, but not knowing. And just crossing my fingers and saying, oh, I hope I'm going to heaven. And I was trusting in all the things that I did, but I wasn't trusting in what he did for me. Right. So when I give my testimony, I try to make it all about trust what Jesus did. That's right. Amen. And now it's up to you to look at your heart and see, what are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Amen. Are you trusting in something you did or said? Are you trusting in what Jesus did? All right. I guess I'm done.